Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Read The Landlady by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is an audio presentation of the novella, with occasional clarifying commentary from me, the reader. Now, if you want to jump straight to the action, feel free to skip ahead to the next video in this playlist. To access the playlist itself, check out the video description below. Otherwise, stick around and I'll explain the nature of this project a bit further while providing some background material on the story. The basic purpose of this Let's Read is to make the literature as accessible as it can be in an audio format. Typically, when you read classical literature in print, you have a host of advantages that you do not have in a conventional audiobook. You might have an introduction from a literary scholar. You may have notes that provide relevant background information that would tend to be lost on a modern audience. You have time to sit and absorb complicated developments in the plot, or to sort out a complicated cast of characters. You have immediate knowledge of how the novel is structured, and so on. In a conventional audiobook, by contrast, you simply get the spoken text rolling on. But not in this audiobook. Here, I wish to read through the novella with you, but will retain the license to add comments where I think it may be helpful to a general audience. In just a moment, I will provide some introductory background information on the novel. When completed, this Let's Read will also contain some concluding thoughts on the book, but it will also have some notes sprinkled throughout the reading simply to clarify points the average listener could easily miss. I will do my best to keep a light hand and to allow the text to stand on its own. But the landlady is a particularly opaque text for the modern English-speaking audience since it is awash in peculiarly Russian folk literary references, and so I will need to interject on occasion, typically at the end of a chapter, just to make sure you don't get lost. Now, I expect to complete this project in two formats. Currently, you are viewing this Let's Read as part of a YouTube playlist. I do think this is the best way of consuming the product, since it allows for ease of navigation and makes the structure of the novel immediately explicit. However, in the end, I expect to assemble all the parts of this Let's Read as a single video for the benefit of search engines outside of the YouTube environment. If that's your preference, expand the description below, and you will likely have a link to that single video. If you are keeping it here, our next item of business is an introduction to the novella itself. First off, the landlady is in the public domain. The version we will be reading is translated by Constance Garnett, and it appears in an old volume entitled The Gambler and Other Stories, published by William Heinemann Limited, which is made available in PDF format by Cornell University Library. In this version, the novella is about 70 pages long, and it comprises a total of six chapters divided into two parts. I should mention also that I profited greatly by consulting a 2008 article by Penn State scholar Linda Evenitz, published in the Slavic and East European Journal, entitled The Early Dostoevsky and Folklore, The Case of the Landlady. If you would like a deeper understanding of our story, this is a good place to start. Many of my own comments are indebted to Professor Evenitz. The Landlady was first published in 1847, when a young Dostoevsky was still experimenting with different literary styles. Indeed, he never before or after tried anything quite like it. When he gained his fame in 1846 with his debut novel Poor Folk, he did so by adopting some of the style of the naturalistic school, which was then in vogue. The characters in Poor Folk are described in a realistic way, and their fates are largely influenced by clear, tangible social and economic forces. The landlady swings wildly in the opposite direction. 
Here we encounter a surrealistic narrative which seems to invoke the supernatural and which is flooded with references to fairy stories, to old legends about evil spirits and sorcery, and to tales about ruthless bandits on the Volga River. In Poor Folk, we see a picture of the world as a naturalistic socialist of the 1840s might see it. In The Landlady, we are introduced to the world as the superstitious Russian peasant might see it. The Landlady is unique among Dostoevsky's works in its deliberate focus on Russian folklore throughout. It is not unique, however, in its indebtedness to other Russian authors. Like much of what Dostoevsky wrote in this early period, this work is inspired by both Alexander Pushkin and Nikolai Gogol. In particular, the core of the plot is anticipated by Pushkin's story Poltava and Gogol's story A Terrible Vengeance, each of which is steeped in the folklore of rural Ukraine. I won't say more about these earlier tales here for fear of spoiling the landlady. There are also references to other stories by Pushkin and Gogol, as well as influence from other authors, such as E.T.A. Hoffman and Vladimir Odoevsky, each of whom wrote about the mystical or supernatural. In what follows, I won't try to ferret out all of these references or sources, or all of the folkloric elements that enter the text but I will attempt to fill in some details regarding those salient references that the author expects his audience to pick up in order to make the text more comprehensible to you. The landlady follows the adventures of one Vasily Mihalich Ordinov, a solitary St. Petersburg gentleman who finds himself drawn into the lodgings of a severe, mysterious old man and an attractive young woman who is our eponymous landlady. It is when he enters that household that our urban intellectual encounters the world of Russian lore, ritual, and mysticism. The plot surrounds these three characters and focuses especially on the interaction between Ordinov and his landlady and the ultimate effect of this encounter on Ordinov. In its radical departure from Dostoevsky's naturalistic roots in Poor Folk, the landlady alienated his original admirers among the critics, and not for the first time. An earlier novel, The Double, also dabbled in Gothic surrealism and was a critical failure. After the passage of time, many scholars today would say that the original critics were wrong about The Double, which was actually a misunderstood work of genius. But I don't think they were wrong about The Landlady. This is not a great work. Dostoevsky's greatest works would come some decades later. I don't even think it is a good one. There is a heavy layer of schmaltz that the reader has to wade through. The sensuality is a bit heavy-handed, and the prose can be awkward and wallows in superlatives that the narrative can't justify. In the end, it comes off as a bit ham-fisted. So why read it? One answer is that even failed literary experiments can be interesting when they're bold. That's especially true when the themes explored lead to future literary triumphs. The landlady has been thought to be fertile ground for understanding the development of Dostoevsky's thought. The later Dostoevsky was a great defender of the Russian common folk and of Russian traditions. What did he think of them in 1847? In Ordinov, we see a forerunner of a kind of character that will blossom in later works. In the dynamics between his three principal characters, we see shifts in the way Dostoevsky conceived the world, and we see harbingers of key themes that will emerge in the great works ahead. But more simply, for all its failure as a work of art, the tale it tells really is an engaging one, and in the end it will leave you guessing. I will have more to say on all of this in my concluding comments after the curtain falls. But I think we've covered enough ground so far to allow the curtain to rise. And so, the landlady. <laughs>